All right, YouTube. It's the guy that you guys absolutely request more than anybody else. Josh Pate's on the show from 24-7 CBS. And, of course, I, the best mind in college football, I'm also here to keep him in line. Jack's here. Katie's back from vacation looking all tan. Well, you're wearing a hoodie, whatever. Anyway, like, subscribe, enjoy. Hello, welcome to Unnecessary Reference Barstool's College Football Podcast, brought to you by the wonderful people at High Noon Hard Seltzer. Yes, High Noon Sunsips, the hot sel- the not the hot seltzer, the, the seltzer that has absolutely dominated this country over the last couple of years, and they are nothing but up. They're going to the moon. I'm staring at the Tropical Pack right now, which has two watermelon, two mango, two passion fruit, two pineapple. They also have delicious flavors like peach, lemon, the, pe- the peach and pineapple, both available in the Tall Boys, 700 milliliter yes. tall cans. Uh, then if you get the pool pack, you get the kiwi and the guava. They're special flavors. If you get the tailgate pack designed for tailgates at college football games, you get the uh, the pear and the cranberry, which that's the only way you can get the pear and the cranberry, by a tailgate pack. Yes. Lemon sold separately. Yes. And they're individual packs. And who knows? High Noon will probably come out with something new before we know it. Before we know it. 100%. They're always coming up with new things. High Noon's delicious. Okay, Katie's back from vacation. She hasn't mentally really returned it's yet. It's normally the two of you. I was going to say St. Patty's Day is coming up. It is. St. Patrick's Day, yeah. In March, I believe, uh, which is a new thing this year. 17th? Huh? 17th? Probably. Probably. Anyway, get you a High Noon when you celebrate High Noon. or Not High Noon. <laughs> when you celebrate uh, St. Patrick's Day or Valentine's Day or any day that's March coming Madness. up. March Madness. Yes, please. The Ides of March, tax season, my birthday, all, yes. all my birthday. WrestleMania's coming up, all big events. Mm. Uh, my team's not making the tournament. No, you're a North Carolina fan. They're not. But at least your team doesn't have set a record. any standing indictments on it today. So yeah. that's nice. That's ahead of some teams. Anyway, we shout out once again Casey Smith, who uh, two weeks ago gave birth to a beautiful baby boy, and everything's good. She's on her maternity leave right now. So shout out Casey Smith. Uh, she is a wonderful part of this program, and uh, I hope her little boy is – I'm sure it's, it's everything's going great. Last week we had Jason Brown sit in, and this week uh, when it comes to guests that we could get, this is the most requested guy. This is the guy who gets the most shout-outs on Twitter. This is the guy that gets the most, uh, you know, hey, when are you going to have this guy on? Hey, when are you going to have this guy? He's the commissioner or whatever because he has a cult following, and that's fine. I hate them all. And he is, of course, the host of Late Kick with Josh Pate on CBS 24-7. It is Josh Pate. My good friend, Josh Pate. Hello, Josh. Yeah, I mean, my acquaintance, Brandon Walker. Look, you you say cult following like that's a bad thing. How big is a following before it's not a cult anymore? Question. Um, and It's not the, the size of the following. It's the, the rabidness of the following. It's the fact that the following is going to repeat talking points ad nauseum uh, at your behest, at your disposal you can say anything and they're going to repeat it that's a cult here's the here's the problem yeah Yeah, i guess i I guess a conundrum in your logic i've never called you a casual single time i may have thought it but i've never (laughs) called you that a single time it's just that people have filled the blanks in and frankly i'm not so sure every one of them even watches my show so like you can you can throw the grenades all you want to at them are they wrong you're dabbo that's who you are you're dabbo you're leading a cult. Now, you've won a couple of national championships, sure, but eh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is it really is it long term? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, uh, you know, a fantastic college football mind, a fantastic college football personality, and someone who deserves all the success that has come his way and will continue to come his way. There. That's the nicest thing I'm gonna say today. I appreciate that. And you look great today, by the way. Your footwear looks better than mine. You're not gonna see my footwear, but it looks better than mine. You look svelte, you look in shape. You've been working out? Don't do this. Don't don't st- don't start this bullshit on my show. Don't. We sat here five minutes ago, and and you said maybe you ought to work out sometime. That's what you said. That came out of your face. All fair. Yeah. What you say behind the audience's back doesn't matter. Hey, do you want to tell them what you sent me last night? Which was a waste of your time because I didn't look over it. But everything you're holding in your hand, all that handwritten cursive. This is called formatting in the industry, people. And formatting typically comes off a printer, and the paper's hot. Your boy here, your guy, your leader, still writes in cursive, credit to you, yeah. and credit to the public education system in Mississippi. Uh, but <laughs> first well, time that's I don't know what credited. we're gonna talk about. <laughs> well, first of all, first of all, writing in cursive only means one thing. It means I'm old. Okay, and that's that's fine. I take great pride in my cursive writing. Secondly, 
there's one person to my right and one person to my left who, who wonders where they are right now because I have this beautiful written format. I never come here. No. There's the never room. a format. I never have a format. I only did it because I thought that's what you like. I thought that's how <laughs> you did your shows. And you texted me yesterday. You said, so what are we going to talk about? I came up with like this 20, is unbelievable. 25 bullet points, <laughs> and then you didn't even read them. He does this it's usually three pictures. Minutes. I usually, usually I sit down before the show and I just make notes. All right, talk about this, talk about this, talk about this. Here, I've got actual, bu- you know, I've got an outline. This it's, is professionally done. It's the most thorough thing I think of ever seen you do. Well, don't get used to it. I'm only doing it to impress our guests. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. fair. And he didn't impress easily, so fuck it. I'm not. I don't even know if I'm gonna. Oh wait, can I cuss around you? In, around you? You can do I'm, it, just not when you come on our show. I mean, I, I got these, kids watching my you know, show. This big money contract you got, I use certain language that I can't use. I'm like I'm like WWF early '94. I've got to build my childhood audience before I mature them. Okay, so you'll you'll enter the attitude era in about three years. Right, right, yeah. All right, so <laughs> we've got several things to talk about. Here's here's what we are going to talk about. A the news, which is uh, you know in February it is what you're going to get. There's not a whole lot of news, but one thing, one proposal came out yesterday that we can talk about with Josh. Uh, number two, I came up with is ten teams to talk about. It's just in the off season. As we go towards the next season, these are probably the 10 most interesting teams. And since you saw the list, I actually added two more. But you didn't look at the list, so what, what do I care? I'm going to pull my eye josh out right now and look at it. We'll follow along together. Okay, I got your format in front of me. Just call your Let's phone. Let's go. You call your phone the eye josh? Yeah, look at that. Look at look at the three <laughs> PDFs that were sent to me. I'll print this out for my own personal record. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about that. And then I just have – I always do a two-minute drill here with these guys where I just uh, – five questions that may or not be – may or may not be about college football, but I will ask you those five questions at the end. But really, Josh, the, the main news item that we can talk about and really pick apart is yesterday – I think Ross Dellinger was the first guy that put it out there, and there were other guys that followed up. But uh, the powers that be in college football have sat down and decided they all – in February, March, they all get paid to come up with shit that uh, sometimes makes sense, sometimes doesn't. But now they're hammering pace of play. Now they're sitting down saying, hey, we got to shorten games. And we got to come up with these rules and these ideas. And the ideas that we saw yesterday bandied about were, you know, stuff like keep the clock running after incompletions. Um, no clock stop after first downs. And such and so on and so forth. And you had one of the best takes on Twitter uh, to me, and it was basically like, where are these people clamoring for shorter college football games? They're not out there. I, you, you probably see as well as I do, you get asked like the same kinds of questions over and over. Everyone wants to talk about conference realignment. Everyone cares about playoff expansion. Like those are th- targeting. People yeah. care about that stuff. That Those are three of the 10 most popular topics that you'll get asked about. I was trying to think back, and I was asking the staff, too, who sees the inbox. I've never been asked about pace of play. I haven't had a single person ever say, hey, can you talk about this on the show? Nobody cared. It's totally manufactured. And it's like the kid who throws a rock through the window, breaks the window, and then says, hey, we got to do something to fix this window. And people just kind of sit by and let it happen. You just said the college football powers that be. Problem is you can't name any of them. Neither can I. Because they're all over there like behind a curtain. I know who the power players are in the NFL, and I don't even watch a ton of NFL. I know who makes the decisions in the NBA. I hate the NBA. But yet in college football, the sport that I cover 24-7, 365, I don't even know who those people are. And it's obvious what the end game is. And it's obvious that your your key problem is not game time. It's format and run time. That's what we would call it in like the television world, which just means – You've fattened up all the ornaments on the tree, so the tree weighs a lot more. Well, the tree doesn't weigh any more than it always did. It's just you got 30-second additional ad breaks 10 or 15 times per game. Halftime's fattened up. Pre and post is fattened up a little bit. Targeting and other things that you have to review take an inordinate amount of time. That has nothing to do with whether you run the clock after a first down. Although in and of itself, that rule, I wouldn't push back hard against. It's almost like this Overton window thing, I think, where – they threw out a really ridiculous proposal in number four, which was incomplete pass. We're going to spot the ball and run the clock anyway. There's no way that's going to pass. And I don't think that they think it's going to pass. Who with that? I think someone who said, we've got to throw something ridiculous in here so that later when we backtrack on it, it'll look like we came to a middle ground with people oh, okay. and we listened to them and we acquiesced. Because all the while, I really think what they want to do is just get that NFL – 
clock runs after first downs. I, yeah. I really think that's where they wanted to go because I really don't think they want to shave 15 minutes off. I think they just want to shave a few plays off. But look, he, like you and I have gone back and forth about the playoff a whole lot. And to me, it's never been just about the playoff. It's been about a much bigger thing. The playoff's part of a thing for me. And that thing is this group of people who like back in the day when the Pac-16 almost happened and Texas almost went and they didn't. And their AD said, it's because we didn't want our kids having to travel that far. It's because of $300 million on the table from the Longhorn Network and ESPN. That's why you didn't go. And in this world, you, you're not about to tell me we're doing this in the interest of player safety and shortening games. There it is. However, however, we may ask someone to play 17 games to win a national championship. So that's it's it's just this whole bigger thing for me. So I have three takes on it. The fact that they're dressing this pig up and, uh, and, and calling it player safety as a way to cover the tracks of doing something that just really isn't asked for. Like player safety would make a lot of sense if you weren't actually expanding the season like you just you just said if you weren't looking for ways to make players play longer player safety would make a lot of sense another thing that, that you didn't mention here and I, I think I'm the only one that either noticed it or, or came up with this maybe I'm paranoid in my head all of the fixes here no clock stopping after first downs uh, the clock running after incompletion stuff like that these all seem like things that will affect close games. Like, if I can't spike the football to slow down the clock, if I can't do these things, if I can't get a, you know, if in the fourth quarter, in the middle of the, four, middle of the fourth quarter, I'm down eight and I can't stop the clock after first downs, it's going to affect close games. Has there ever been a, a fan in the history of college football watching a close game saying, you know what, they need to step in and fix this? No. No. If this wouldn't, if it's a blowout, fine, whatever, but this is going to affect close games and strategy at the end of games and probably reward teams and coaches who might make a mistake in these situations. And number three, and you touched on this as well, you can take out first downs, you can take out incompletions, whatever. How about if there's seven seconds left in the first quarter and a team punts and you go to commercial and you come back, you run play, you run a play, then you go to commercial. How about get rid of that crap? How about instead of a 20-minute halftime, a 15-minute halftime? NFL does 12. So there are certainly places you can cut back that don't include on the field, and this on the field stuff is is hogwash, like you said. Here's the problem. Um, that It gets a little nuanced. Like everyone says, hey, do you like this? Simple answer, yes or no. It's, it's never that simple. There are always layers to it. So, like, I believe in free market capitalism. I believe in making as much money as you can make, but at the same time, I believe there's a certain Rubicon, a certain line in the sand that once you pass, you start to delude your product. And so right now, in the name of chasing $1.8 billion a year instead of $1.5 billion a year, and you add, I mean, you've got to add commercial inventory to do that. That's the way you make money in the media business. You lengthen the runtime of games, and then you have the same folks who sign those contracts come back and say, well, the games are taking too long. And they hope you're stupid enough. Like, that's the problem. Yeah. They think you're actually stupid enough. These are people who were not skilled enough to make it in the actual sport of football. It's like politicians. They're not actually skilled enough to do anything, so they elevate in the only ladder they can elevate on. And the college football administrative world is the same. There's a reason you don't know these people's names. It's because they don't want you to know their names, because they would be exposed very quickly if they were forced to debate in an open forum like this. But there's a certain line you cross. And so the answer is very clear. The answer, to be clear, is shave out commercial time. It's that simple, but yet then they come back to you and say, but then we wouldn't make as much money. Do you want us to give up money? Yeah. And it's it's not like your margins are razor thin right now. They lie to you and tell you they are. At the top of this industry, at the top of college football, yeah. the margins aren't razor thin. Do do what we go to a go to a campus every Friday night and tour facilities. Go to conference offices and watch how many people just sit there and make $95,000 a year to do nothing. Uh, they're, they're not like raised thin on their margins to begin with. I would disagree with the last statement, but that is what it is. Jack's the only one man enough to wear just a plain white t-shirt around there. Uh, first of all, she's wearing a barstool hoodie. Okay. Positive vibes only. She's, she's repping and look at me. I look fantastic. What's under it. Huh, a lot Spanx? of fat, a lot of fat and some, a couple titties. Um, but anyway, that's the dream anyway. Anyway. All right. So I'm anxious to see if any of this passes because when it comes to college football, change can either be rapid fire or glacial, 
right? And there's no real in between. We've had probably 20 years worth of changes in the last three years, and that's that's yeah. what's happened. But like playoff expansion happened over a couple of couple of years. There was a lot of talk, a lot of consternation, a lot of guys like me and you going back and forth, and me ended up being proven right. But there were there was a lot of that. But now this just comes out of nowhere. Yesterday, I'm anxious to see if like next week we find out this is this is passed and they're just gonna do it because sometimes it feels like they wait and see the public opinion. Sometimes they just go and they just do what they're gonna do. And I'm anxious to see what they do here. It's no different than the political world. Like it very much mirrors the political world. And that's because political types are really who run college football now. Now, obviously, in the comment section, someone's going to say college football's always been political. That's like an NIL when Jaden yeah. Rashada happens and someone says, well, those players were always being paid. Brother, they weren't always being offered 13 million a year and, and, and multiple schools weren't engaged in like litigious conversation behind the scenes. That didn't always happen. College football wasn't always run like this. And so what I think is going to happen is some of it will pass. And they kind of they kind of float the balloon. And I think the Overton window thing is absolutely valid here. They're going to throw some stuff out there that's red meat for you that you'll chew up and you'll spit out. And then they'll say, OK, public doesn't like it. We'll scrap that or we'll scrap that. And they never plan on rolling with it anyway. Yeah. They plan on rolling them with the first three. And the fourth one is just kind of to appease you again, assuming that you're a total idiot. I'm going to thank you. I'm going to throw out uh, another little NIL discussion since you brought it up there. Um, NIL is just something that we kind of learn from every year and we, we, we roll with and we see how it's taking college football. And I think, I, I believe you probably agree with me that, that players being able to, to capitalize on their name is, is a good thing and players getting paid is a good thing. Um, I do think it puts us in an interesting spot in the sport where now we've got an unprecedented time. Jaden Rashada is, could be disliked by college football fans and he's, he hasn't graduated high school yet. He, he hasn't had his senior prom yet, but he is he was at the heart of a Florida scandal where somebody might have offered him this and they didn't come through and whatever. A lot of, lot of murky waters there. But now kids are showing up to campus, not just with expectations, because expectations have been there on, on big-time players for a long time, but expectations and then, and then like, you owe us something. And that's a weird spot to put a lot of these kids in, Josh. I, I hope what I'm saying – what do you think about that? I think um, it is very interesting that you could, like, be a heel college football player before you've ever played it down. Correct. That's very interesting because normally you have to manufacture that. This is not manufactured. Like, this is real. This is, this is authentic. Yeah. Secondly, general philosophy on my side is, yeah, I, I love that they can make money off their NIL. If that's the pure form you're making it in, third part is – regardless of how the offer got put on the table to Jaden Rashada, how are you about to hate a kid for doing something no different than you would have done? Yeah. Who in the world out there who's working a nine to five job and is either coming back at me on Twitter or calling him to talk radio show, trashing a kid is about to turn down $13 million a year. If it's on the table, who, rich people wouldn't turn that down. Certainly normal people wouldn't turn that down, but I'll tell you the other thing, it, it, this is so infancy mode for, for NIL right now. Yeah. I've never spoken to more athletic directors. I swear to you. I talk to coaches. I rarely talk to ADs. And all of a sudden, all the ADs want to talk, which I'm happy to listen to. Um, but I had one the other day ask me point blank, do you have any advice for me? And I'm sitting here thinking, I, I, want, I want to get feedback from you. Like, I, no, I don't have advice for you. Yeah. I gave him some generalities. But I said, um, I, I do know this. I think NIL five years from now is going to look so rapidly different or so radically different. And I, I think that people don't understand the value of IP yet because it's so new for everyone. Yeah. You work at Barstool Sports. I work at 24-7 Sports. Because these companies are so big, you've got high noon on the table in front of you, which indirectly you profit from. You've got Academy Sports and Outdoors on board, which indirectly I profit from. They didn't partner with you and I because we're standing on the street corner, no matter how talented we are. Right. They partnered with us because we have ourselves attached to a very, very big company. And in college football, no matter how talented you are, ultimately what gives you your value, what gives your NIL value is your rub against the LSU brand or the Ohio State brand. They haven't figured that out yet. When they do, and it'll be through like the Learfields and IMGs of the world, group licensing or in other words, packaging the Toyotas and the yeah. Chevys and the Pepsis of the world, and you getting a cut of that, a very tiered, understood, predetermined cut of that, 
based on your positional value and based on the university you go to, that's what NIL is going to look like. It's not going to be collective driven. Collectives won't even be in the college football vernacular five years from now. But right now people think it's wild, wild west, which it kind of is, but everything goes through that. Like once upon a time, we had to mount up on horse and wagon to go to California. Now you can fly there in six hours. You just got to go through it. You know what? Collectives are like uh, collectives are like a bunch of gamblers that ran into the casinos in Vegas and think they run the casinos, but actually yeah. the corporations are going to come behind. The corporations are the one making monies off those casinos. And you're right. That, that's exactly right. I do find it interesting that the controversy this year happened with like the, and I don't have the official ranking in front of me, but like the number seven or eight ranked quarterback. Didn't happen with any quarterback ahead of him, like the top six, and didn't happen with anybody directly behind him. It just makes me wonder it, it, in future in the future will guys rank one through six see that thirteen million dollar number that number seven didn't didn't end up getting and be like well that changes the way I'm going to do business I I don't know it's it's the Jaden Rashada name I don't think Jaden Rashada has to throw a pass in the next four years I don't think he has to be successful in the next four years to be a very key name in the sport five years from now yeah yeah he's well he's a He's a change agent. I don't necessarily know if there was anything unique about him. He's talented enough to be in the conversation. Yeah. But somebody was going to have that happen. And it just so happened that he got himself caught up in the, the blender that is recruiting in the state of Florida right now. Yeah. And you've got total desperation in Gainesville and Coral Gables. I mean, other universities kind of said they did the same thing with Cormani McLean. They kind of said, no, nah, we're, we're good. We'll pass. Yeah. You're, you're a talented kid. That's why we called you. But 800K or in this case, 13 million. No. I, I don't think we'll have these kinds of numbers ever floated around in a high school recruitment again. I think you'll look at it, and like I said, five years down the road, you'll tell you'll tell someone who's new to the game a story about Jaden Rashada, and they'll say, what? Like, only the most proven quarterbacks even enter that kind of conversation yeah. now. But Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, those dudes are the ones making that money. Why? So – you brought up the Carmani McLean, and then there was the Nick Saban quote that said there was this cornerback that wanted 800K, and it seemed like that he was definitely Carmani McLean, allegedly. He got 800K, but Carmani McLean, across almost every composite ranking, ranked higher than Jaden Rashada. The most interesting part about Rashada to me was he was like, I'm not saying he's not a talented quarterback. He could be the best quarterback. We don't really know. It's a 50% chance with these quarterbacks, but he was ranked fifth or sixth in the quarterback rankings behind some big time ballers. And Carmani McLean, number one cornerback in 800K versus 13 million. It's I know there was that Miami versus Florida thing that probably helped him boost up a little bit, but I don't know. It was just very I weird. Think, I think that's 100 percent it. I, I think the 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 two teams that he had going to war for with each other was the perfect storm. I mean, Miami, and he's right. Miami is desperate. Florida, not quite as desperate, but it's a new it's a new administration, new coach, and they need they need to make a splash too. So they got some desperation too. Not as desperate as Miami, but these are two teams and that needed they're fighting each other, fighting desperately to get back on top of that state, and and I think that drove it up, drove it up, drove it up. And it wasn't the coaches, it wasn't Mario Cristobal and uh, Billy Napier sitting down and saying, "Well, I'm going to one up you here." It was these boosters that want to be these swinging dicks mm. and be like, "Well, I can't let Miami beat us. We're Florida." I think that's what it boils down to, and that's Jaden Rashada ended up in the right spot with the right teams to drive his price up. The other thing is we speak in absolutes about market rate and player value, and that's not as understood as folks assume it is. Mm -hmm. The Really, think about it. It's not public record in most cases. So the only way we even know is through media reports, which may or may not be true. So yeah. like, I can tell you because I talked to a coach like, What's today? Tuesday or Wednesday? So like last weekend, I talked to a coach and I asked about a player from this last cycle. And I, I gave him the alleged figure. He said, number one, that's nowhere close on the <laughs> on the on the too heavy side. And number yeah. two, he said, we didn't even know. Like we couldn't find out how much someone else was offering because it's not public record. They don't have to report it. And so I, I, I know 13 mil is on the high side, but I don't I don't really even know how the the 24 seven sports composite player rankings versus the tier of value even even worked itself out. All right. So now we transition into part two. And this is where I'm about to read an ad that I will drop in a little bit later. I am starving. I You just told me that. It's all you've been talking about for the past hour. But guess what? If you're starving and you want to take care of yourself, you want to do it in a an affordable way, in a healthy way, factor meals. Factor. 
Yes, and don't forget about the healthy part. We all think about it January 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th. What about the 6th? But, <laughs> but, good, that was a good one. but, no, no, you made, you made me laugh. But when you get to February 21st, like we are today, you can't forget. We sometimes forget it happens, but just make it, make it your February 21st resolution. Fuel up fast with ready-to-eat nutritious meals delivered straight to your door, leaving you time and energy to tackle everything on your to-do list. Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit that helps you save time and eat well. You skip trips to the grocery store, skip the chopping, the prepping, the cleaning up too. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat and enjoy. No matter your lifestyle, you can have Factor. It has delicious flavor-packed meals to help you live to the fullest with keto, calorie smart, vegan, and veggie. Protein plus options on the menu each week. They've got 34 chef-prepared, dietitian approved weekly options. So there's always something new to try. 34 is a lot of meals. Not only is Factor cheaper than takeout, but meals are ready faster than restaurant delivery. Get Factor and enjoy clean eating without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh flavor-packed meals delivered to your door ready in just two minutes. No prep, no mess. I have had Factor for a while now, and it's the perfect lunch. I get to try mine Factor. tonight. It's the perfect lunch. I got a text message from my roommate saying, hey, a box from Factor arrived. So that's the thing I'm running home to do. I am very excited to unpack and see what I got. Head to factormeals.com slash walker50. Use code walker50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code walker50 at factormeals.com slash walker50 to get 50% off your first box. Factor Meals. See how smooth that was? It was so smooth. This is a pro over here. By the way, I want to get you. I was smiling. I want to get you on the record, Josh, because I think we said this off the air. I, I am personally challenging you to a <laughs> softball home run derby. Uh, 10 outs, everything that's not a home run's an out. I will beat you hitting home runs over a softball fence. Yeah, you're going to pick the field, too. Oh, I, you I pick, you pick no, the no, you no. Pick the field, you pick anything you want. I'm not, you're not going to let me pick the field because you make me have to come to Nashville for everything. You're not going to, you're not going to come to a place that I'm going to, I, I want to be at. So I, it'll have to be in the greater Nashville area, won't it? Yeah. Well, we actually have <laughs> land available here. Yeah. Don't get on me about in Nashville. I'd, I'd move there in a heartbeat. So what I wrote down was 10 teams to talk about. And these are just 10 teams that I think are – are they the best 10 teams in college football next year? No. But are they the most interesting? I, I think I did pick the 10. Now I've got 12. Um, and these are in really no order at all. You just want to talk teams real quick with me? Yeah, roll through them. Let's go. Okay, well, you ain't got to get upset. Uh, I'll I'm just, just ready. I'll probably, I'm just go, ready. I'll probably just go at my own pace. Hold on. Let me pull my format up again. Are we going to go in order? <laughs> You know, you're a real son of a bitch. That's what people don't know about you. People, you're a match made in heaven. People people think, oh, he's the nicest guy ever. No, this guy's a prick. But that's okay. That's okay. Are you calling someone Okay, I'm ready. Prick? Let's go. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> oh, he's ready now. All right. What? What? what I, no, I, I see. Smirking. I see in his face. He's got a joke. What? What do you? Is it because the way I write T's? Is it because I don't write T's in cursive? Is that it? It's just it's. Some if a third are, grader, if a third grader brought this home. A parent would say, you're doing so good, but, and then they would slightly critique the work. Can we post this? Like, can we make this public? I'll, yeah, I'll have unnecessary reference put it out after yeah, the show. Yeah, 100%. Or you can, you you can do it. Do it. Yeah, yeah, I don't do give it. a shit. Also, also, your thumb is on the edges of all the pictures, <laughs> and your thumb. cuticles can use some work, man. I got, I got a bad thumb. Yeah. Do you yeah. get manicures? Huh? Do you get manicures? No, I'm not a woman. Um... Uh, when's the last time you got a pet, uh, manicure? Never. I've never done it. Mm. Guys should get pedicures. Why? It's comfortable. It's good to get dead feet. By the way, Josh, is this a big deal for you to get to see Jack Mack and Katie Stats? And, yeah, it's and, it's a huge deal because because frankly, I'm I'm they're they're more cordial with me than you are. So yeah, it's a, it's a huge true. deal. We are yeah. De definitely yeah. A little nicer. You know, when he leaves, y'all y'all still have to be here. Well, I don't know, I man. We got we. Got, Hey, we got a lot of open cubicles here right now. <laughs> right. We've got a lot of room in this office. A lot. <laughs> Spacious. All right, here's the team I pulled out first. This is in no order, but I just wrote them down first. The Tennessee Volunteers in 2023 I think are fascinating. Because I believe fans, um, casuals, as you might call them. Yep. <laughs> you son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I believe fans have an idea – about Tennessee that might be wrong, at least in my estimation is wrong. And they believe that because Hendon Hooker is not going to be there, 
they're not going to be nearly as good. But my thing is, Hendon Hooker at Virginia Tech was a thoroughly average quarterback, and when he got to Josh Heupel in Tennessee, Josh Heupel and Hendon Hooker worked together and became an unstoppable force. And their offense is designed to make you make decisions 20 yards down the field, and Hendon Hooker knew when and where to deliver the ball at all times. If he did it with Hendon Hooker, tell me why he can't do it with Joe Milton. I am not writing this team off for going 10-2, and 11-1, and 12-0 <laughs> this year. I think they'll be a better team this year. That doesn't guarantee better record. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, if you got me to November, it wouldn't shock me if some odds maker came out and said, hey, here at FanDuel or DraftKings or whatever, we would favor 2023 Tennessee by three over 22-2022 Tennessee. Um, there's already case study for this. Number one, you mentioned – so you mentioned both parts of it, really. I don't have a ton to add, rare though that may be. When, when Hendon Hooker came to Tennessee, here's what you can't do. You yeah. can't be the guy who said – so what? He picked up Hendon Hooker. And then also say, well, yeah, Hendon Hooker's shining. He's playing in Josh Heupel's offense. <laughs> like that's, yeah. that's called development, man. That's yeah. called fit. And also, you can't say Joe Milton, ooh, accuracy issues, which he had had. Like That was the book on him. And then all of a sudden, he plays Clemson, and it's just dime after dime after dime. So either he was the most zoned in you'll ever see, or you got an early four-quarter case study that that dude's been sitting on the bench but working under Josh Heupel and already got better. Jalen Hurts when he got benched at Bama and, and got to work under Sark, not even yeah. starting for a year. There's a reason when he came off the bench against Georgia, he was able to win. He was a better quarterback. And so Joe Milton's a better quarterback. And they're also bringing in one of the top players in the country to where if Joe Milton doesn't work out, they got a five-star quarterback that is there for spring and could very well be ready to go. So – they're they're also very silently recruiting better players defensively. Yeah, that's the thing no one will talk about because it's it's offense. That's the name of the game there. So I think they'll be a better team this year. What that means, I don't know. They got to go to Tuscaloosa, so we'll see. They were so bad defensively. Still went eleven and two. They were so bad defensively that a twenty percent improvement on defense makes them a remarkably better team. And Joe Milton, I listen, if I saw Josh Heupel do it with Hendon Hooker, I'm going to assume he is capable of doing it with Joe Milton. I'm just going to assume that. And one of the things that doesn't get talked about enough is Hendon Hooker did great in the offense, but Heupel's offense just results in more open receivers than any offense I've seen. They, right. they, con they confuse you. They make your, your defensive back end make decisions. And, and when if you hesitate for a second, Jalen Hyatt's by you, and there'll be a new Jalen Hyatt. So – I, I think Tennessee is fascinating this year. Now, I didn't enjoy Tennessee's rise to glory this year because Tennessee fans acted like all of college football was waiting for them to be great again. But uh, that's just me. I'm I'm kind of a, a dick like that. You know what you ought to do one time is come to one of these games and actually stay for the game and meet these people with me. I think you may sing a different tune about Tennessee folks. First of all, first of all, you and I were at the same Tennessee Ole Miss game last year. You hid from me. Uh, secondly. If you're if you're in a private jet with Dave Portnoy and Dave Portnoy says I want to go home and get to sleep, you gotta get in the, you gotta get on the private jet. I had no choice. Well, you got a choice. It's just called commercial. Live that life. <laughs> Break a blue collar out every now and then. Like live amongst us. I grew up in West Point, Mississippi. I'm the bluest of blue collar that ever blued. Okay. But if I mailed you a uh, but if I mailed you a birthday card right now, the address I'm sending it to reads what? Well, soon it'll read Chicago. I'll be Midwest nice. I'll be salt of the earth. I'm, I'm headed there. I thought the Tennessee folks deserved what they got because unlike some fan bases who check out when they suck, Tennessee fans never checked out. They can be obnoxious, but yeah. that's not a bad thing. We get to have a job because of that. So they never checked out. Like they were, they were sold out when Dooley was there. That's a the fair latter point. portion of the Butch Jones era. They yeah. got into the fact that that dude had trash cans on the sideline. They embraced it all. So they, I think they deserve it. That's a fair point. And, and they, they, they embraced um, Jeremy Pruitt. They embraced, but yeah, okay. I, but still, it was a lot. It, team two. Wait, before you do that, what? Josh, you mentioned jo um, Jalen Hurts. It's been a debate on the show. Who can claim Jalen Hurts, Oklahoma or Alabama? Uh, I just, I just, I, I rode the fence, man. I surfed the fence on this. Nobody, I did, I, he surfs I did. the fence like I've never seen yeah, anybody. Oh, he's, surf he's the very fence. good. He's, one, the fence he's like the surfer. Kelly Slater. He's the Kelly Slater. He doesn't hate surfer. anybody. He loves every fan base, every team, every coach. They're they're all that. He's a smart champions. guy. <laughs> and let me say, he's it works. He's smirking too. <laughs> so it's the same thing with like the any. I grew up on the Chattahoochee River, yeah. so it was always Bo Jackson. Herschel Walker, that whole debate. Yeah. And so my dad taught me when I was a kid, just tell people, I'll let you pick first and I'll take 
whatever's left over because there's no losing side of the debate. Yeah. Well, with Bama, like I did, I did say the first thing I think about with Jalen Hurts is Alabama, but if I was Oklahoma, I'd, I'd claim him. So I don't, is there, a, I don't think there's a wrong answer. I just, I've heard Hurts talk about Bama more. I think Bama more with him, but it also helps that the 2018 SEC championship game, the one I just referenced, yeah. all the games I've been through, that's the most memorable moment. Cause like you saw the display on the field, you saw Nick Saban get choked up in the post game interview, but I walked. So I happened to walk off the field with him, Nick Saban, like I'm right behind him. Cause the media place was up Alabama's tunnel. So Saban gets off the field. And then, like, breaks down, just balls his eyes out. And I saw that. So I can't erase that from my memory. So that's what sticks with me when I think of Jalen Hurts. My only thing with it, uh, the, my sticking point is I remember the summer of 2018 after Tua had won the national title and they were both coming back. And Alabama fans online picked their horse, and it was Tua. And that's fine. He was a very good horse. But they they were Tua, 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 and they were saying things about Jalen Hurts, and they can pretend now that they weren't, but they absolutely were. And he handled it with, with grace and class. But, if he Josh, if he were a backup quarterback for the Patriots, nobody, the Alabama fans wouldn't be saying a word right now. Okay, the fact so, that he's good, they're, they're coming back saying that's our guy. So this, this got me a little bit of heat the other day because I remember, same thing you do, and I remember when they opened fall camp, when Bama opened fall camp, they let they have fan day down there. It used to be called the running of the gums, but no, they stopped that. Running so now, of the gums, that's, that's what it is. That's just, just called fan day. They don't let them run out anymore. So um, they, they let guys talk to the media. It's just like a wild free-for-all. Well, Jalen Hurts had not said a word all summer. And he had, he had watched what you said happen. It absolutely happened all summer. And Jalen Hurts had this like 30-minute impromptu – state of Jalen Hurts with all the assembled beat writers. And he said, I was a little taken aback that people thought I was just going to transfer out of here. Like everyone gave up on me. Yeah. The coaching staff never asked what I thought. No one asked what I thought. So now basically he said, I'm going to tell you how I feel. And we know the end of the story now. So it's celebrated at the time. I said on the show the other night, I remember what Bama folks said and they were rubbed the wrong way. Not every one of them, but a lot of them were rubbed the wrong way by it. And so there is a little revisionist history at work there. One day I'm gonna get you on the show, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make you say who you hate because we all hate somebody in college football, whether it's teams or fan bases. You're going to admit it one day. I swear to God, it's in there. You have to pull it out of me, but it's there. I won't admit it freely, but if you ask me the right question, I would not lie to you. Watch this. Ask me who I hate. Who do you hate? Everybody, brother. Everybody. You hate Dabo. You hate Dabo. I don't. I, I don't hate Dabo. No, I don't hate Dabo. I think Dabo's what? goofy as shit. I don't hate Dabo. I hate Dabo's fans, his cult fans. Dabo's goofy. Tremendous coach. Phenomenal coach. Goofy is so, a three dollar bill. I want to get him on the show because I, I think he's got idiosyncrasies. They dared me to use that word. He's got idiosyncrasies. Yeah. I think if if you gave me a choice of bottling up his college football worldview. Or the folks we were talking about 30 minutes ago. Yeah. I'd probably rather inject a little more Dabo Swinney than folks behind the curtain into the game right now. Well, this this show is uh, performed on God's name, image, and likeness. So I think Dabo is probably going to want to come on this show and it's going to be a fantastic time. Now, I got to move on because I only have you for an hour and I think we're, yeah. we're about f seven minutes in. So, team two is actually two teams Texas slash Oklahoma. Both desperately need bounce back years. One needs it to prove they got the right coach. The other needs it to prove they got the right coach. So Sark is two years in. Venables is one year in. If you had to put money down right now, not to say both of them can't have 10 win seasons, but if you had to say, I will put my money on this team having the best bounce back this year, which one would it be? It's Texas. They're, they're two years further along. They There was a huge lie about Texas that – I'm not saying we as a company propagated it. I'm saying people used our material to propagate it. So they used Texas's recruiting rankings to say Texas is loaded because they were finishing high in recruiting rankings. Therefore, Sark should have won immediately. Yeah. But it was it was misleading. It was like intentionally miscontextualizing a recruiting ranking because they they recruited terribly on the line of scrimmage. They just recruited a ton of perimeter guys and running backs and. That gets you ranked high if you recruit enough of them that are four and five stars. They had no line of scrimmage talent. When he got there, they had like eight offensive linemen and 18 receivers or something like that. So they had to totally overhaul it. They've done it two cycles in a row. He's still not proven. 
but neither is Brent Venables. And if you, I, I can't remember what the number is, but if you look at the team that Lincoln Riley had, mm-hmm. and then look at the first team Brent Venables had, the attrition is shocking, like you've never seen before, because it's the Portal era. Um, there's just I don't know anything about Brent Venables. The Oklahoma attrition is shocking. I don't know anything about him? The attrition is shocking. However, there were still, and this is leaning on those 24-7 rankings again, if you go by those 24-7 rankings, there was still a shit ton of talent at Oklahoma last year, at least better than 6-6. Six and six. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, at the same time, so I don't, what I'm about to say, I don't necessarily have this as my belief, but if I had to counter the argument, I would say, okay, but maybe in, in a long game format, maybe he had to completely torch the barn, kill the rats and just start over from scratch. And if we have to swallow a subpar first year in order to get where we want to go, like, you know how that goes, blah, blah, blah. But the problem is if you're, if you're Ryan day and you come in and you, or if you're Kirby smart and you come in and you tell me that now that you're proven, I I will not question it. Nick Saban had to do that at Alabama. No one questioned it because they knew who Nick Saban was. No one knows who Brent Venables is as a head coach. I will say this though. My biggest doubt about him was I didn't know if he could recruit Texas because I didn't know if he could recruit, period. And they've recruited Texas really well, two top 10 classes, two top 10 portal classes. So if he does fail, it won't be because he lacks the talent. Team number three is the Alabama Crimson Tide. Since they won their first one under Saban in 2009, they won 2009, 11, 12, 15, 17, 17, 20. Yep. They've never gone three full seasons since they won their first, they've never gone three full seasons under Nick Saban without winning a national title. Well, we're working on two right now, and Georgia still looks really good next year. They're replacing their quarterback. They're replacing Will Anderson. Are we about to see the first time Nick Saban goes three years without a national title? And if so, is Nick Saban still Nick Saban? Yo, well, yeah, he's still Nick Saban. I wouldn't pick them to win the title this year. They're replacing both coordinators, too. Yeah. We, they got they got so much churn but there, that we could just kind of leave that out. According to Alabama fans, that's a good thing because I was told by Alabama fans the only reason they didn't win it this year was Pete Golding and Whistle Dick. What's his name? Bill, Bill O'Brien. O'Brien. So they replaced them with Tommy Reese and with um, – help me. With Kevin Steele. Kevin, Thank yeah. you, Kevin Steele. Uh, they replaced them. At least do we get a return to – and now I'm acting like they haven't been anything. They, they lost the national title game last year. But I'm very curious as to what Nick Saban gets out of this team next year because, like you said, new quarterback, new new faces on defense, really. I mean, Will Anderson's gone. I don't know what Alabama looks like next year. I have no idea. Yeah, so, look, it may very well be that Nick Saban just does what Nick Saban does. That's always in the cards. But yeah. I've been hearing the same stuff you hear from Bama fans which sounds like I'm trashing them because I've done it for the past 10 minutes now. I'm not. But here's the thing I always say in response. If you're trying to tell me Kevin Steele is going to lead you back to where you want to be and Tommy Reese is going to lead you back to where you want to be, if I were to have asked you your opinion of Kevin Steele and Tommy Reese on November 1st, 2022, you would have trashed both of them because you had no clue they were in your future. So you can't sing a different tune just because they're putting a script A on their chest. Like, in reality, yeah, that does matter a little bit. But you're claiming they're going – Alabama's not the reason. They're going to be the reason coming to Alabama Why all of a sudden both sides of the ball are resurrected. And this was supposed to be the year. Like, 2022 yep. was the year. I had coaches telling me for three years, that team in 2022 is going to be the one no one wants to deal with. It never turned out that way. Well, just because it didn't work out doesn't mean that you don't still suffer the consequences the next year of what was supposed to be – uh, a pop year. So I think they got a lot of questions. It's first world questions, but they got a lot of questions. The fact they went 10 and two with a team that had a Heisman trophy quarterback coming back. And if this were last year, Will Anderson would have been the number one pick. They had the best two players in the country coming back and they went 10 and two is shocking, but it's Nick Saban. So you never, you never put him to the side. I am surprised he didn't pull off a, a, a coup and go get a Drake may or go get, um, you know, uh, uh, a big time quarterback that you didn't expect him to get. Just go get somebody to to plug in there, and he is going to roll apparently with either Jalen Milrow or Ty Simpson. So yeah, I th- they got confidence in both of those dudes. Like yeah. they they don't think quarterback's going to be the huge issue. Here's the other thing that they would never admit, but I think it's a reality. So Nick Saban won a certain way for a long time. Then yeah. all of a sudden he went the superstar quarterback route. You can't watch Georgia do what they just did two years in a row with Stetson Bennett under center. 
and and not be Alabama and say, wait a second, like I remember once upon a time when that's all it took at quarterback. If that's seriously still all it takes and the game, the metrics say is shifting back to a more defensive minded yeah. approach two years in a row now, if that's all it takes, I don't. I don't have to like sacrifice my overall identity and philosophy to throw for 4,000 yards. I can, I can do it with the two guys we already have here. Team number four, the Miami Hurricanes. Can they salvage? What is salvage? Like, do we realistically expect national championship contention? Can Mario or... Cristobal get them to where they want to be, which is national championship contention within two years? No, not, no, not within two years. If that's where they expect to be, it would I think that's, me I don't think there. that's impossible, Josh. I didn't say it was impossible. I said I don't think it's going to happen. Two years. Yeah. Dude, that's hard. What, that's is Kirby, it, what, Smart, Kirby Smart did that at Georgia. Yeah. That's the barometer. So, And Georgia was better off that he inherited than what Mario just inherited. And so, no, I don't think that's going to happen. It's a more wide-open path in the ACC, but no, I don't think that's going to happen within two years. I think they'll get to well beyond respectability. Yeah. Because the path lends itself. People forget this. They were favored to win the division last year. Yep. And and they sucked. So I don't know, man. It's tough to to like do the etch a sketch thing and just erase the vision of Middle Tennessee dragging you. <laughs> dragging. And they dragging weren't you. even that like Middle Tennessee wasn't even that they were a good team last year, but they weren't but they were middle the of the best road. team in conference USA. They were middle of the yeah, road they offense. Got beat the next week. Yeah. They, they were middle of the road offense and absolutely put on a highlight reel when they were down in South yeah. Florida. I, I Miami in 2022, one of the more shocking teams I've seen in a while because I, I I drank their Kool Aid, which is fine. I thought they'd go 10 and two, but just the fact that Tyler Van Dyke just fell off completely. Every good player they had fell off, and that's that's weird to me. I, and, you gotta you got I will say this: so everyone sung the praises of Cristobal when he went and got Josh Gaddis, yeah, because he was the Broyles Award winner. So. I said on the show, I don't like, I'm not you. I don't like doing the kind of segments I'm about to talk about. But I did it about Josh Gaddis because I couldn't ignore how many people reached out to me when he won the Broyles Award and said that's the most fraudulent win in the history of that award. Yeah. He's going to crash and burn at Miami. Wait and see. It was unanimous. I didn't have a single coach hit me up and say, Mario killed it. They thought they had, but no one else did. So sure enough, Miami's offense is a disaster. Credit to Cristobal because you got to swallow your pride Recognize to just hit the it. dump button after one year. <laughs> yeah. So they, they did it. We'll see how that works out. But like, I, I feel bad for the Tyler Van Dykes of the world because it's the total inverse of Hendon Hooker. You're yeah. so much a prisoner or a beneficiary of who you're married to as a coordinator. So I don't know. We'll see. I'm not sure the shot at me was necessary in that whole rant. But you like that stuff. Like you, you, you relish in in talking about how terrible people are. I, I like getting in the mud. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm basically a pig. I'm, I'm most comfortable in the mud, and that's that. That's fine. That's where I like to live. Uh, one more thing on Miami. I do think Tyler Van Dyke is a great choice for being the dude this year. I, I, I think, I think you throw out that year, and he can pick up right where he left off and be one of the five to ten best quarterbacks in college football in 2023. And if that happens, that speeds up their process a lot. Dude, we just saw Bo Nix do it at Oregon, and no one would have believed that about Bo Nix. It can easily happen. Yeah, and 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 Michael Penix Jr. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, number five is Colorado. How quickly can he start climbing? All right. This uh -oh. is the dumbest. This is the dumbest conversation that's happening right now in college football. So I think Deion Sanders is a great choice for them. I think he's doing incredible things out there already. He's probably brought them more marketing value than they would have organically gotten in a hundred years. Yep. He is bringing in a totally different caliber player than they would have gotten in a million years. How, having said that, you know, the college football sphere as well as I do, they, what they won one or two games last year. If they go one, four and eight, yep. it would be a good year. Someone's going to, in fact, hundreds to thousands of someone's are going to come at you saying, told you he wouldn't even make a bowl game. And it's the just I can't even wrap my mind around the ignorance because someone already said it to me the other day. I did an entire segment on it. I said, I think they're going to be much improved in 2023. And someone said, watch and see, he won't even make a bowl game. They, they can win half the amount of games it takes to make a bowl and be an improved team. Both things can be true two years from now, which is sort of the year he keeps pointing towards 2024. Yeah. See me in 2024. That is going to be really interesting because you don't have a case study. 
There is not a data point in history. Lincoln Riley would be the closest thing to this, but that's not even comparable. There's not a data point in all of college football history that is usable right now to say, here's what happens when something like Deion Sanders happens. You're just totally reinventing and restocking a football program. And, and you're, you're doing it almost on the fly. It, it's not a two- or three-year project. You're not even doing it via traditional recruiting. So I, I, it's a good decision. Whether he makes a bowl in year one, or, I, don't, I don't really care about that stuff. It's the right decision. One of the, I think one of the key comparisons to look at with Dion here, and, and Dion has a higher ceiling, I believe, because he's a program with a higher ceiling. But I think the, the Kansas um, model of what they've done over the last couple of years is very much in play. He took yeah, over a, a team point. that had won one, two, one, two. And the, his first year there, I don't know what they won, three or four, and they beat Texas. They, 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 went, they didn't win a whole lot of games, but they, they competed in a whole lot of games. They almost beat Oklahoma. They did beat Texas. And then in year two, and you can tell me it's six and six or seven and five or whatever it was, and that's not that big of a deal. At Kansas, it's a huge deal. Monumental. And what he did was in year one, he made him competitive. And year two, he started breaking through. And that's what Dion Scott – year one, he has to be competitive. He has to – if they – and I don't know their schedule, but if they play USC, lose that by seven, lose that by ten, lose that by 14. Don't lose it 58 to seven, right? And if he gets them competitive, and then in year two, 2024, that's when you start making hay. And at, at I think Dion's making hay – is getting them to at least looking at the playoff in three years. Because that's the caliber of player he's going after. But the most interesting aspect of Colorado that I think a lot of people are missing is they're in the midst of a conference that a lot of people don't know what's going to happen to. They don't right. have television rights right now. Yep. There's some rumors that, oh, they're bringing on schools, and there's other people saying they wouldn't be surprised if the Pac-12 just blows up. That's probably very not – or. Not a huge chance of happening, but Dion's in the middle of it, and it's like, it's not like he's oh Colorado's going back to the Big Twelve and that's yeah. where he's going to go. He's in the midst of a conference that we don't know what's going to look. It, he could be playing San Diego State in a few years. I think it's more likely he's playing Kansas State in a few years. But yeah, I mean, yeah. So point taken there. Here's the other thing. Um, he hired an insane coaching staff. Yeah, and he's going to get all the shine, rightfully so, and it. When they start succeeding, it's going to be because he hired an insane coaching staff. Charles Kelly just won our Recruiter of the Year award nationally from Alabama. Yeah. He's not at Alabama anymore. Deion Sanders got him. So he's got a really good staff out there. It's not like I think some people who watch this sport from a very like drive by casual viewpoint and they just kind of see the surface, they think, oh, Colorado hired Deion Sanders. That's kind of a gimmick. That'll get them a lot of airplay. Yeah. They hired a football staff. They hired him, and he hired a football staff. So, yeah, Dion knows what Dion doesn't know. Like, Dion isn't going to go out there and say, I'm the best X's and O's coach in the country. He's going to hire guys to handle that. He's going to be the player acquisition guy. He's going to be the face of the program. He's going to be the motivation. And he's going to do a lot of that teaching and development. But Which is incredibly impressive because we know he has a massive ego. Yeah. But he, his ego is big enough that he also recognizes, hey, I can't do that. But 30, 40 years around the game, he knows what wins football games. Which is huge. Yeah. All right, let's go quickly because I don't want to uh, run up on time again. Uh, number six is Wisconsin. Are you prepared to see a Phil Longo offense at Wisconsin and not see three yards in a cloud of dust? I'm just prepared to see offense at Wisconsin. They <laughs> Me fell too. Back on, they fell back on that excuse for so long, man. I'm so excited about it, though. It's it's so inexcusable. And, but, but at the same time, I've tried to talk Wisconsin on late kick several times. It is a total dud as a topic, so we don't do it a whole lot. Yeah. But I've watched the program, per, like selfishly, I've watched the program because I think to myself, like I think this about the Big Ten. The Big Ten ought to like pray to God every night that Ryan Day and Jim Harbaugh keep doing what they're doing because that should be a much deeper conference than it is right now. Penn State's pretty good, but there's a lot of just average in the Big Ten right now in Wisconsin and Iowa and Nebraska. It shouldn't be that way. Yeah. Should not be that way. Like I should not look at, I should not look at South Carolina, all due respect, and say, boy, they're trending in a lot better direction. I feel a lot more positive momentum around them than a bunch of the programs I just mentioned. There's no way I should feel that way, but that's been reality. Yeah, I think Iowa is about to look in the mirror with Wisconsin actually changing their offense and moving into the 21st century. Iowa's going to have to look in the mirror and say, you know what, this has been a great coach and a great time in our program, but. 
we have to get serious about modern football, and they're going to have to face a decision very soon. Wisconsin already made that decision. Wisconsin was already also very aggressive in making that decision. Yeah. Like their their previous coach didn't probably didn't deserve to be fired. If we're if we're being honest, when you just go X's and O's and wins and losses, like they had a a, a down year this year, but I don't know that it was fireable. But they said, you know what, we got to get serious about this and life changing. They went out and hired Fickle. I'm very excited about Nebraska and, and Wisconsin and see if they can take that side of the conference and at least get serious about football. Moving on. Hold on a second. So, I mean, your show and all. But um, that's media rights money talking. So that is that is a conference getting a ton of money and then going to their member institutions and not so subtly elbowing them in the ribs and saying, what you're doing is not going to work anymore. We're not necessarily going to come in and, like, nationalize your program and just call the shots from Chicago, but Wisconsin, you got to be aggressive and, and you got money now. Cause we're giving it to you. Nebraska, you got to be aggressive. It's no coincidence. They got Luke fickle. I never would have thought Luke fickle was going to Wisconsin two years ago. I yeah. never would have thought Matt rule would end up at Nebraska. Those are not the caliber coaches that you would expect those programs to get. It's a good sign. Iowa is the one that's on the clock that you just mentioned. Cause they got the same coach they had. They prepared for Y2K with the same head coach they have right now, yeah. which is wild. And so, yeah, I think it's it's good for the entire conference. Do you think the Big Ten and those conferences will nudge a little bit and say, hey, we'll help you with the fall? Because we saw Paul Christ get fired, and then immediately there's articles already written about that. Oh, he didn't care about recruiting. He didn't care or he didn't put in hours in the offseason. His coaches couldn't reach him for six months, whatever it was. I think that they don't even have to – they can just insinuate it, and it's understood. Like, we all know in, in the media industry, there are about three voices that anytime anything needs to get disseminated from the Big Ten, it's coming from one of those three voices. It's always a friendly narrative towards the Big Ten. So, yeah. absolutely, if they need to <laughs> the net or soften the fall – under a head coach that they had to throw under the bus. Yeah, they will be ready, willing, yeah, and able. Yeah, I think, yeah. Shout out to my good friend Joel Klatt. Just, I just felt like it was a good time to give him Joel's a shout not out. Right one, he's not even one. Of he's them. not one of them. <laughs> he's uh, not one. I was just saying, hey, I just want to shout out my friend. I don't know what y'all are talking about. He would be, he'd be a good guest. We like Joel. Well, we're, we're trying to make a play for him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to make a he's play. Not a, he's, not, he's not as friendly competition as this one is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, quickly getting through teams. Um, the uh, TCU, what's the encore? I don't think it's going to be all that pretty. I'm not saying either. six and six. I'm, I'm not. I'm just – they – they. if you froze yourself in August and you unfroze yourself now, so you knew what you expected from them and then you saw the result, but I didn't show you the scores. Yeah. You would see they went undefeated regular season and they played for a national title, so you would think they were dominant. Because, yeah. like, we had a topic in August, is any Big 12 team going to win 10 games? And it was, it was very debatable. And one of them did in the regular season. One of them did. K-State won nine games. But TCU didn't dominate. They dominated Iowa State. Otherwise, they were one possession wins. That's good. I can't take it away from you. But you're asking me about 2023, and you're losing everything, including offensive coordinator, that yeah. I came to know about you. And so that, that conference, people hate on it all the time. It's the most competitively balanced conference in America. I think it's the most entertaining conference. They're all the same last. team. They're yes. all the same team. It's crazy. You just It's like dice throwing every week, yeah. and no one's favored over anyone by a lot. School children will study the 2022 TCU season in 10 years and be like, how, how did this happen? Like, like it, it, Again, you're right. Phenomenal that it happened, and they got to enjoy the spoils, but it – if you if you threw all those pieces up in the air again, they would never land the same way. It's yeah. just not possible. Number eight, Georgia. What's the ceiling on this run? Is three in a row possible? Yeah, it's possible. I didn't think – I thought it was reasonable to expect that they'd have a little drop-off last year. I yeah. think that about every championship team. So I think two things benefited them this time last year. You've got Georgia. I grew up there. I always thought to myself, any, if they ever win a title, the hangover will be – out of this world like enormous yeah and it never got a chance to happen because number one they sent so many guys to the draft that kirby essentially had a new team that hadn't proven anything themselves but number two so much stuff hit the fan this last spring and summer that no one really had time to talk about georgia i don't remember doing full segments on georgia because we were talking about conference realignment and all this stuff and like it was the entire spring yeah. and summer playoff so, expansion yeah yeah, so they didn't have the spotlight on them that you would normally have. They didn't have a bunch of returning starters that could 
theoretically suffer from complacency. So then when I went to the Tennessee Georgia game, like the, we thought it was going to be the biggest game of the year this year. I went over there Friday night and I met with a lot of their staff and they, to a man said, we have never felt synergy like this. Like we have never had a staff that everyone just likes everyone. Everyone gets along. It's not always been that way here. It won't always be that way here, but whatever the head man down the hallway has done, he's put together like the perfect combination to where they, they already knew they had that team. It's not like anything's guaranteed, but yeah. they, they already knew that Friday night before the Tennessee game, they were totally at ease with what was about to happen. Team number nine, the Clemson Tigers is a new offensive coordinator slash quarterback. The fix it, it's, it's part of the fix. It's a fix, right? It's, I mean, I look, I quarterback was an issue and play calling was stagnant. Yeah. But I, look here. So, so let's say this happens. It, two, both of these things could be true. So Cade Klubnick could be out of this world this year. Yeah. And, but what if, what if DJ plays at a high level at Oregon state and we just find out Dabo made that disastrous a hire on his offensive coordinator, because I, I'm not a believer that DJ Uyangle is just going to crash and burn forever. Right. It, it's no coincidence that his best game was his first game. And he, he deteriorated after that. Uh, he was playing on natural ability his first game, and then he got Clemsoned, as was the previous state of Clemson. So I think absolutely he he made – Dabo made the most important hire, non-head coach hire, that anyone made in this past cycle. Um, I still question the receiver room, though. They've they've been so down in that position room for several years now, and that was once the one of the best receiver rooms in the country, and now everyone talks about Ohio State or Bama yeah. some year. They don't ever talk about Clemson anymore, so that's what they got to fix. So they have they've lost their eliteness at other positions, like, like yeah. obviously Trevor Lawrence and everything. But uh, and I'm not trying to say Shipley's a bad running back. I'm not, but but they were like elite of the elite at running back for for a while and receiver elite of the elite. You're talking stocking NFL rooms with Clemson receivers now. I don't think NFL scouts need to go to their to Clemson games if they need a receiver. They they just don't. So they need to to, to get elite there. Let, let me quickly get to Team Ten. Um, this is actually three teams, but it's really about one. Ohio State, Michigan are at the top of the Big Ten totem pole, and they're they're jostling back and forth. Can Penn State in twenty twenty three join them and make it a three team race? Oh yeah, they can join them now. I'm I'm not about to make a prediction. They win anything up there. Yeah. yeah I so I think they will be as competitive a product this year as you've seen. Um, I think they're going to be really damn good this year. I think they are too, but yeah. everyone's going to talk about the quarterback, which yeah. they should. And it's very important to remember that's not a true freshman. That guy's been there a year. He's going to start as a first-year starter, but that's the best quarterback talent they've brought in. Yeah. But here's the other thing. If you do an inventory of their roster, they don't have big question marks elsewhere. At mm -hmm. Auburn, for example, like you've got, yeah, the Robbie Ashford, maybe him being married with Hugh Freeze is a great fit. They have to replace 10 linemen. They have no wide receiver talent. At Penn State, you're not saying that. They got great tailback talent. They they have leveraged the portal two cycles in a row in a very high level at receiver. Defense, they made one of the most important hires last cycle in getting Manny Diaz up there, and it paid immediate dividends. So I think they're in the conversation this year. And, and that's, again... When you combine that with what we just said about the West, good things are happening in the Big Ten. Finally. Yeah, I think they're potentially a playoff team. I, I, I think they're going to be that good. And and probably the most exciting pair of running backs we've seen um, seen in a while outside mm -hmm. of a couple of SEC schools. Ohio uh, State, too. Ohio State as well, yes. Um, all right, now, two-minute drill. I have nine minutes to do a two-minute drill, which is about standard because two-minute drills never last two minutes. Right. Give me one team who can be in the playoff picture that hasn't been in the playoff picture the last few years. Give me oh, one. You want, you want one? I'll give you one. I know so get ready to clip me. this. I, I, I see it in your face. I know who he's going to give me. Where am I no, going? I'm going I'm to write it down. I'm going to write it down and show it to Jack. Go ahead and give me that team. It's not Florida State. Well, I don't know how he did that. <laughs> All right. You, you wrote Florida. I, no, I wrote Florida what? State. Oh, I didn't see the ST at the bottom. My bad. Go ahead. I was like, what? Florida. So I want to go way out of left field. So I want to talk about Texas A&M. Because yes. Texas a and is what would Josh. Kind of no, yes. Josh, yeah, yeah. come on, Josh. I'm with this. I'm with this. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go, go ahead. Speak your piece. You oh, we speak got two yours. minutes, so speak your piece. Go. By all means, let's drag the two-minute drill. No, you go. So, here's the problem. Here's the problem, Josh. When you don't make a bowl game, 
<laughs> it's because you have bad players. 99 times out of 100, you have bad players. A&M doesn't have bad players. They were just 13th out of 14th in the SEC in points per game, 101st nationally in points per game last year. If I did nothing else but tweak their offensive points per game, in other words, hire a better coordinator, they've got the talent it takes to be a playoff team. So, again, this is February. This is not a prediction segment. But you're asking me, who could make the playoff out of left field? To me, at this point, credit Mike Norvell, FSU wouldn't be out of left field. All right. They're going to be a co-favorite in the ACC. Texas A&M, it shouldn't be this way, but it would be this way. If they made the playoff, that would be like a TCU-level reverberation of where in the world did they just come from? Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and, and, and it's possible TCU did it. My, my only thing with that is, yeah, he brought in a new offensive coordinator, but it, I don't think – Bobby Petrino is is the difference in four and eight and making a playoff. I just don't think he's that caliber difference? offensive coach. What's the difference? Like what what if six points a game is the difference in four games? They and weren't getting blown out. Like TCU, is there a Quentin Johnson on this team? Is there a Max Duggan on this team? I don't think there's any of those players. TCU had incredible players that, that just finally did what they did this year. I don't I don't think AM has those guys. And I know I think they got some good players. I think they haven't talent, had players that have been able to be realized. The overall talent, especially defensively, is pretty good. I was looking at total defensive stats last night because I was trying to make a point. Texas AM had the number one pass defense in America last yeah, year. Yeah. Like a lot of it's there. And that's in the SEC West, which had some good quarterbacks. But I, I don't know, man. I, I just don't see all the momentum from that number one class is gone. It, it's like it it's all They it, still have a it very talented vaporized. Roster. They still have a very talented roster. Good enough to compete Huge. with Alabama and, 100%. and LSU? 100%. All right. Nope. Maybe not Alabama, but like it is good enough to compete in the SEC. Obviously, took that him, would Took them to the last play last year yeah. in Bryant-Denny Stadium. Question two. This is a stock question. You can buy stock in one of these freshman quarterbacks. Arch Manning, Dante Moore, Nico. Iam uh, It's yeah. not him. It's Dante Moore. I'm going Dante Jackson Moore. Jackson Arnold or Malachi Nelson. Oh, I thought you were done. I wasn't done. You just were being rude. I was uh, like a ch change up of all change ups. Arch, okay. Arch Manning, Dante Moore, Nico. I am Aleva. Jackson Arnold or Malachi Nelson. Dude, Malachi Nelson could be a model. I said this when we were at Elite Eleven. If football flames out for him, he could just he could just go be a male model. Well, I'm not just asking like, who the most handsome one is. I'm saying it was I'm stock. saying that's part of the reason I'm buying stock because like good looking dudes play better football a lot of times. Jackson Arnold is my favorite player out of the group you just mentioned. However, you you threw me Dante Moore, right? Yeah. Okay, so Dante Moore is going to play for the right guy. He's going uh, to play for Chip Kelly. Agreed. And I I think dude I think the game's coming to Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly detests recruiting, and all of a sudden the sport has turned to him and said, what if we don't make you recruit high school players? Yeah. What if you can either buy them or you can just get kids out of the portal and say, okay, it didn't work out where you are. Come live in Los Angeles and play football. It, he's doing it again. He got the running back from Kent State. He just got this quarterback. They're like UCLA is going to be a good team for a little while if they can keep that up. Do you think Dante's going to start in this I think he's going to start, but I also think they have a good backup option there. Yeah. So who did, they brought in the Kent State kid, right? Yeah. And then Carson Seal was the running back. Yeah. Carson they still brought in Schley. Yeah. I, I think, Schley, yeah. I still think that, I don't think you pay that kind of money to Dante Moore for him not to start. But then again, I just said that because it sounds good in a fortune cookie and it may not be true. I love cookies. Question three You have the power to ban one thing. What is it? And oh. you like to fancy yourself the commissioner of college football. I have to ban something in the game or just anything, period? You know what? I actually just wrote, you have the power to ban one thing. What is it? I didn't specify college football, so it can be anything. Okay, I hate questioning play calling. But okay. after the fact. I hate yeah. questioning it after the fact. So if you want to tell me that you don't like lining up I formation, uh, third and goal on the three, and you've got receivers that you should throw it to and you need to spread it out, if you could have a way to disseminate that to me before the play happens... I'm cool with it, and I'll listen to you. But far too often, these people who get the benefit of hindsight and then yeah. want to question either personnel decisions or play calling, there's no skill in that. Like a blind monkey could do that. You already know whether it worked or not. So I guess questioning play calling. But this is where I really should have read your format because I should have done more due diligence on this question because I could go 
all afternoon. We could do an entire part two series on what we would erase about the sport. I gave you the format, Josh. Your, your, your refusal to read it is on you and not me. It's my fault. It's on me. Two more questions. Number four, you have been, uh, you, you do your, you name your tour something different every year. One year was the Renaissance tour. I don't remember every given Saturday. Was that last That's year? Right. Every given Saturday? Look yep. at that. Uh, so you, you take a tour every year. You go to games. I'm not asking you the best stadium or even the loudest stadium. What's the most unique college football stadium you've ever set foot in? The OU Texas game, the Cotton Bowl. I'd never been there before until last year. And I, to be honest, like a kid growing up in Georgia, I thought they were overhyping it a little bit. Yeah. But it, it wasn't overhyped. And it helps that I saw the highest scoring game in history and it was back and forth. Um, oh, I last year, that, last year. Not, not, not yeah, the 49 no, no, game no, no. last year, last this year. Was a, yeah. This was a body bagging. I'm talking yeah. about the year before yeah. where it was like Texas is down 28-3 or something. Yeah. So that was so above and beyond even the way they hyped it that I – first off, I love old stadiums. Like, should be Cotton Bowl all the time over Jerry World, but that's sure. just personal preference. And secondly, um, the the split in crowd and the way they split it down the 50 instead of, like, splitting it in the end zones is so crazy because if you're standing in an end zone, like when a, when a ball goes up in the air, and several of them did that day, you've got the defensive crowd screaming for a sack, then everybody goes quiet while the ball's in the air, then the offensive side explodes, and when you factor in how long it takes noise to travel to you, which is like a split second if you're 100 yards away, yeah. and you mix that in with the fact that if you're media, you can walk up the tunnel at halftime, go out into the fair and like eat funnel cake, then come right back in and watch the second half, and, and you have the smell of that wafting over because it's not a huge multi-tiered stadium. That is the best experience I've ever had in college football. You had you had me at funnel cake. And last question uh, on your tours, and I ask this of everybody that does college football: What's the best meal you've had in a college town? I loved a place called Wright's Barbecue up in Fayetteville. Up in uh, Fayetteville, I went there yeah. for the yeah for the Cincinnati game this past year. Now, granted, I was suffering from caffeine overdose at the time, so I had to wear sunglasses. I couldn't really see all Wait. that well. Caffeine overdose. What happened? So I was drinking. You know the Starbucks in a can, the cold brew coffees? Sure. Yeah. So I started just inhaling those things, the, just the black coffee. Um, and I'd not drink a coffee a whole lot before that. So I was drinking like half a dozen of them a day. Oh, my God. After a while, when I would wake up in the morning, I would open my laptop screen and like slowly but surely, I had to start squinting. And when we would come in the studio, these LED lights, they would bother my eyes to the point where I had my eyes would water. And I was trying to make it through the show. And then I started to have blurry vision in one eye. I had no clue what was happening. So I realized I'm so regimented that there was there was very few things that I changed about myself. But cold brew coffee had been one of them. So it took me a little while, but I figured out that was the culprit. So I stopped drinking them. And 48 hours later, my vision came back. Light sensitivity is gone. But that was right around the time I went up there. So that restaurant stands out to me, even though I couldn't see. Right, barbecue. All right. Well, let's put that on the list. All right. It is 4.15 on the dot look at how we did that josh uh i know we uh we battle back and forth on twitter but you are truly one of the best voices in college football i mean that and i appreciate any time that you ever come on the show sir home and home you're now welcome here at your leisure thank you yeah but you you're gonna make me come down to nashville i'm, I'm gonna come oh you're crying i'm gonna let nashville? you i'm gonna let you come to that plus you have multiple things to do down here now we got to find a softball field we got to get you mic'd up in here it's gonna be worth your while I can't wait. That is Josh Pate of 24-7 CBS. Uh, you know, late kick with Josh Pate every Sunday, Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. Thank you very much, man. Yes, sir.